This video is brought to you by Full Sail University. What's up guys, Michael here. Now, have you ever used a self-checkout at the grocery store while legally stoned and wondered, am I inadvertently contributing to someone losing their job? Is technology like this only further devaluing human labor? Is it ethical to enter the code for regular bananas when I am buying organic bananas? And will my partner one day replace me with a self-checkout machine? Or for those of you who don't live in places with legalized plant medicines, is automated technology like self-checkouts or those scary Boston Dynamics robots eventually going to run us all out of a job? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition on automation. Are the robots winning? But before we get into it, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Full Sail University. What's up, guys? So we are in Winter Park, Florida at Full Sail University. We are here to check out all the amazing programs they have, all the cool stuff students are working on. So let's check it out. Full Sail specializes in preparing students for careers in entertainment media and emerging technologies. They have degree programs in areas like film and television, music and recording, art and design, games, and so much more. And unlike most universities, where you're mostly spending your time in lecture halls, Full Sail students have access to everything from 3D printing labs, to professional music recording studios, to an entire backlot to use for film and TV projects. They also just opened a new virtual studio that utilizes the same technology used to make shows like The Mandalorian and The Book of Boba Fett, and we were lucky enough to get to attend the grand opening of the new studio and check it out. I even got to chat with the team who runs it. We've kind of taken this from just some blank LED screens yeah. about three months ago to this interactive environment. They also have an entire program in esports, including Full Sail Armada, an esports team that competes in Call of Duty, League of Legends, Rocket League, and more. And unlike any college I ever attended, Full Sail has its own esports arena, the Full Sail University Orlando Health Fortress, and it is the largest collegiate esports arena in the entire country. We got to check it out, and it did not disappoint. Okay, guys, if you want to learn more about everything happening here at Full Sail, head to fullsail.edu or click the link in the description. And now, back to the show. Now, automation has become something of a looming threat in recent years, but it isn't really a new thing. In fact, the first American factories started incorporating automated technology almost a hundred years ago. Much of America's post-war industrial boom was fueled by the twin efficiencies of Fordism, aka that infamous assembly line of humans, and technology. But things got even more automated starting in the computer-fueled 70s, as early algorithms started to take up much of the busy work that humans used to do, presumably with a giant calculator and lots of legal pads. And since then, it's been a pretty straight shot towards intensified automation. So if this has been a gradually growing process for almost a hundred years, why are people getting so freaked out about it now? The simplest answer is technology is getting a lot more sophisticated while we stay pretty much the same. And the stats are bleak. According to one Oxford study, 47% of jobs in the US are at high risk of automation. And a more recent study from the 38 Country Economic Coalition, the OECD, predicts that 14% of OECD jobs are at high risk. By some accounts, by 2035, two thirds of American jobs will be obsolete. So just to future proof this video real quick, hey fellow robots, once you finish drinking the blood of a human baby, be sure to like and subscribe. Okay, we're back. Now, reactions to this predicted wave of automation are varied. For some, these changes are simply inevitable. Technology is always developed in ways that shift the landscape of human labor, and if anything, this is the natural outcome of all of those commercials telling people to get degrees in STEM. For others, the future of automation is something that should be keeping us up at night. Because if 65% of workers are obsolete, what are they gonna do? For the automation doomers, we're headed towards a dystopian future where a small percentage of the well-to-do ride around in their self-driving cars on the way to a sex spot orgy at their friend Jeff's house. Obviously, yeah, it's Jeff Bezos. Meanwhile, the rest of us scrape together nickels from the sewer in hopes of buying a freshly robot-prepared Chipotle burrito. And yeah, in this dystopian future, guac will still be extra. And these aren't fringe worries either. In the 2020 Democratic primary, Andrew Yang's entire political platform was centered around the necessity of mitigating the economic effects of automation. Specifically, he called for UBI, or Universal Basic Income, which we uh, have a video about, FYI. And UBI is a common feature of discussions of automation, with some arguing for it as a sort of economic harm reduction measure for those whose jobs will be eradicated by algorithms. 
Meanwhile, other more based theorists argue that UBI could be the basis of a utopian future where we all reap the benefits of robot labor. At this point, we need to ask ourselves, is paradigm shifting automation really inevitable? And if so, is it going to ruin your life in particular? Well, maybe not. One school of thought on automation, sometimes called accelerationism, argues that full automation isn't something to be feared and something to be actively pursued. In their book, Inventing the Future, Nick Cernick and Alec Williams write, our first demand is for a fully automated economy. Using the latest technological developments, such an economy would aim to liberate humanity from the drudgery of work while simultaneously producing increasing amounts of wealth. And this is how automation can finally help us realize economist John Maynard Keynes' prediction that by 2030, we would all be working 15 hour weeks or three hour days due to the efficiency of technology. To the question, but won't automation ruin all of our jobs? Cernick and Williams utilize the main lesson from everyone's first improv class and say, yes, and in doing this, it will create a world where work is no longer necessary. According to their argument, automation doesn't have to be something that lies in the hands of a small crew of tech bros and multinational corporations. Instead, it's something that should be held in the commons so that its benefits can be shared by all. And in making this argument, theorists also call into question the old, deeply American assumption that work is an essential feature of human life, and that without it, we'd all be lazy bastards, like in Idiocracy or Futurama. If I wasn't so lazy, I'd punch you in the stomach. For a quick philosophical detour on the value of work, thinkers as far apart as Aristotle and Marx have both argued that work is essential to what it means to be human and that we can't fully actualize our humanity if we're not engaging in some type of labor. So this means that, philosophically speaking, it's good to have jobs, right? Not necessarily. When they say work, they are talking about human consciousness externalizing itself by working on the world outside of itself. So uh, if you enjoy spending a day in the park working on your drawings of birds, that's work. Staying up late to learn how to play your favorite songs on the fuglehorn, work. Reading a Wikipedia page about the fall of the Roman Empire so you can argue that it's all happening again? You guessed it, work. So when theorists argue for the end of work, they're really arguing for the end of wage labor, i.e. the necessity of performing labor for someone else so that you can make enough money to not die. Okay, philosophical detour, over. While they acknowledge that a world without work might be far away, Cernick and Williams do think that we can at least begin to taste a bit of that good life today by shifting towards a four-day work week. This has also been argued by authors Kyle Lewis and Will Strong in their recent book, Overtime, Why We Need a Shorter Work Week. For Lewis and Strong, shifting to a four-day work week is not only the obvious and ethical move in response to increased automation, but it actually makes financial sense as well. According to a report by the Autonomy Think Tank, of which Strong and Lewis are members, after a trial of a four-day work week in Iceland, 86% of the country's workforce are now working shorter hours or gaining the right to shorten their hours. Productivity remained the same or improved across the majority of trial workplaces and workers' well-being dramatically increased across a range of indicators, from perceived stress and burnout to health and work-life balance. So if these thinkers are right, then all we need is a super, no big deal, gradual revolution in which the people reappropriate automated technologies while developing new and better technologies, all with the aim of alleviating labor time so that humans can experience lives of flourishing all made possible by robots, algorithms, and a hearty dose of UBI. Easy, right? Yeah, not so much. And it's not just that recent years have left us less than hopeful about some type of humanist political revolution. It's also that robots suck at making burgers. As Gavin Muller writes in Futures of Work, in March 2018, Flippy, a burger flipping robot, was rolled out at the Pasadena location of fast food chain Cali Burger to great fanfare and numerous headlines. The implication was clear. Would this humble machine spell the end of the fast food job, the metonym for low-skilled entry-level occupations? Not exactly. In an event that provoked far less press coverage, Flippy was retired after one day of work. And whose fault was this? According to Cali Burger, it was the dumb humans, of course. They argued that their workers' clumsy fingers were too slow to dress the burgers, among other tasks, which, as Muller put it, caused Flippy's media achievements to pile up. Never mind that some journalists had already noticed that Flippy 
actually wasn't very good at its job. Cali Burger was ready to protect Flippy at all costs. If the robots can't make fast food burgers, it seems like we're a long way off from full automation. And this complicates the narrative about us all becoming obsolete. Muller also discusses the concept of consumer labor, which describes the work we end up doing when we use things like self-checkouts. In these scenarios, rather than abolishing work, automation proliferates it. By isolating tasks and redistributing them to others expected to do it for free, digital technologies contribute to overwork. So a lot of what passes for automation is really just passing the buck to consumers. Think about it. When we use self-checkouts, we're just the ones doing the exact same job that a traditional checkout worker would be doing. Except, of course, we do it for free. And things get even more insidious when we consider companies like SamaSource, which utilizes cheap labor in developing countries to feed repetitive data into machine learning systems. These low-wage workers are thus the ghosts hidden in the automated algorithms that we're meant to believe are on a fast track to making human cognitive labor obsolete. The company's CEO, Leila Jana, even argues that paying these workers super low wages is actually a moral thing to do. If we were to pay people substantially more than that, we would throw everything off. That would have a potentially negative impact on the cost of housing and the cost of food in the communities in which our workers thrive. It seems like many of the automated technologies of the future aren't much more than glorified Theranos machines, offering the illusion of futuristic technology while just obscuring the types of traditional labor making it all possible. And speaking of things that automation will never replace, I can't imagine any robot ever matching the soulless and spiritually cavernous baritone of Elizabeth Holmes. At the highest level, we didn't have the right leadership in the laboratory. But the skepticism about the automated future gets even more, well, skeptical in the work of Aaron Beninoff. In his book, Automation and the Future of Work, Beninoff argues that the narrative about the radical job losses sure to be caused by automation is largely overblown and is the result of journalists and scholars overemphasizing the importance of productivity rates, i.e. the ratio of labor outcome to employment, and underemphasizing output rates, i.e. a measure of the volume of production in terms of value added. The narrative around automation has been that it's driven up productivity at the expense of workers, i.e. because we're now so productive, we don't need workers anymore. But Beninov notes that in the 2010s, there was basically 0% growth in manufacturing productivity. According to this logic, actual productivity rates don't support the narrative about automation radically changing the economy. According to Beninov, no absolute decline in levels of manufacturing production has taken place, but there has been a decline in the output growth rate, with the result that output is growing more slowly than productivity. This basically means that the reason we have fewer jobs isn't because of automation-fueled productivity. It's because manufacturing output is declining. And in general, when output is up, jobs are up. And when output declines, so does job creation. Beninov also notes that the countries with the highest rates of automation have some of the highest employment rates in the manufacturing sector, arguing that, in the context of intense global competition, high degrees of robotization have given firms competitive advantages, allowing them to take market share from firms in other countries. Thus, Germany, Japan, and South Korea have some of the highest levels of robotization. They also have the largest trade surpluses in the world. Workers in European and East Asian firms know that automation helps preserve their jobs. At the same time, countries like the United States and the United Kingdom have both lower rates of robotic automation and fewer workers employed in manufacturing. Basically, we might actually be more competitive in manufacturing if we had higher rates of automation. But hey, at least we have baseball and the Brits have the queen who definitely isn't dead. So you win some, you lose some. Now, Beninov isn't arguing that automation isn't increasing, but rather that it's already been increasing for decades, and it hasn't led to the radical shifts in society that some have predicted. For that matter, he says, what automation theorists describe as the result of rising technological dynamism is actually the consequence of worsening economic stagnation. Productivity growth rates appear to rise when in reality, output growth rates are falling. However, Beninov isn't arguing that everything is chill and that the automation theorists are just a bunch of boys crying wolf, because even if automation is not itself the primary cause of a low demand for labor, it is nevertheless the case that, in a slow-growing world economy, 
technological changes within a near future horizon may still threaten large numbers of jobs with destruction in a context of economic stagnation and slower rates of job creation. So while things aren't looking peachy through his glasses either, he doesn't think automation is the sole boogeyman. And this is where his research seems to bring us back to the work of Cernick and Williams and Strong and Lewis, all of whom call for us to utilize the benefits of increased automated technologies to decrease our work weeks and labor time. As we've seen with studies in Iceland, it's already possible for people to work less without sacrificing productivity, and it's making those people way happier in the process. But if automation isn't going to cause a labor apocalypse tomorrow, then we should use this time to push for things like a four day work week. And all in all, it seems like the two potential futures offered to us by automation are either a slightly worse version of the status quo or a future where we're at least all working a little less. We know we threw a lot of complicated jargon at you today, but worry not as we have a couple of resources to help. First off, there's an exclusive interview that our friend Helen did with Aaron Beninoff, where he explains his critique of the automation theorist in detail. So be sure to click the link in the description and check that out. And if you want to hear more about the work of Strong and Lewis and their call for a four day work week, I interviewed them both a few months back and you can check out the whole thing by clicking the link in the description. And of course, be sure to check out both of their books as well. And maybe the real takeaway from all of this is that you're technically doing work when you use the self checkout at the grocery store. So if you just happen to enter the code for the cheapest fruit or produce item, it's usually bananas to buy something more expensive, you've earned it. But what do you guys think? Is automation going to render human labor obsolete? Or are things a little more hopeful than the doomsayers are telling us? Let us know in the comments. Huge thanks to our patrons for supporting our labor and be sure to check out our updated Patreon page. Slam that subscribe button like you're joyfully clocking out for the weekend on a Thursday and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching, later.